The following message is a presentation of Ligonier Ministries, home of the radio program Renewing Your Mind with R.C. Sproul. When we consider the doctrine of the providence of God, we are immediately thrust into the realm of mystery. We've looked at the story of Joseph's plight in exile and in prison. And in his moment of reconciliation with his brothers, when he said to his brothers, Don't be afraid. You meant it for evil. God meant it for good. But there were many, many, many years passed and much deprivation and soul-searching and struggle before Joseph ever saw the purpose of God revealed. And for many of us, In our whole lifetime, we don't see the reason for suffering, for tragedy, for pain that we endure. The most difficult experience I had as a young man was the fatal illness and death of my father, where he was incapacitated for three years before he died, and I was 17 when he died. And that event made me angry with God and angry with the world because I couldn't see any useful purpose in this abject misery whatsoever. And yet it was only a few months after my father died that I was redeemed by Christ. And I still don't know what God's purpose was in those events. But I sometimes wonder, I certainly know that God used the death of my father to bring me to my knees. And I like to think that in the providence of God, in a very vital sense, my own father gave his life for me. But as I said, this is the mystery of providence, which mysteries are not by any means always transparent to us. Now, there's another story that gives us a brief insight into the perspective of all of this trouble from somebody else's viewpoint, not from the viewpoint of Pharaoh, not from the viewpoint of Joseph, not from the viewpoint of his brothers, but the viewpoint from the one other person who lost as much as Joseph when his brothers betrayed him. It was his father, Jacob. Now, Jacob was not a pagan. The providence of God was not an unfamiliar doctrine to Jacob. Jacob had learned the truths of God by the fires in the camp of his own father, Isaac. He had heard the promises of God's provision from the lips of his own grandfather, Abraham, who told him of his episode at Mount Moriah, I'm sure. Jacob is the man who wrestled with God and to whom God revealed the inner chambers of heaven itself when he showed him a ladder that connected this visible world with the invisible world of God. Remember that account at Bethel? When after Jacob was awakened from his midnight dream, he said, surely God was in this place, but I knew it not. He came to the realization that what had been hidden from his eyes, what had been invisible to him, was nonetheless real. Now, if you had an experience like that, don't you think the next time something happened that you couldn't understand and that you couldn't perceive and that the causes and the purposes remained invisible to you, you would have some confidence that God was in the place? Not if you're like I am. It tends to be that our faith and our trust in God is only as strong and as vivid 
as our recollection of the latest blessing He's given to us. But when He tarries, and when the arm of the Lord is heavy upon our lives, we begin to struggle with our confidence in His providence. No less a man than Jacob endured that same struggle. They say that time heals all wounds. That's a half-truth. There are certain wounds that mend partially. But in this lifetime, their pain and their mark is never completely erased from the soul. Jacob did not forget the loss of his son Joseph in five minutes. When the brothers returned from their treacherous act and handed him that coat covered with blood and said, Oh, my father, how we grieve with you. Your beloved son Joseph has perished at the hands of an animal. And Jacob tore his garments and wailed in grief and in mourning. I wonder what it was like for the brothers of Joseph to watch the grief of their father, the lines that were etched in his face, the burden of pain that was on his back every single day thereafter when they knew that they had brought this pain on their own father. Well, then the episode occurs where the famine comes. And Jacob commissions his sons to go to the court of Pharaoh to get relief from the famine. And you know the story. There they encounter Joseph. But they don't know that it's Joseph. And Joseph decides to put his brothers to a test. He indirectly and somewhat surreptitiously inquires about his family. Is your father still alive, he asks. Because Joseph wanted to know if the father that loved him and had bestowed his favor upon him was still alive. And this group that had come and descended on the court of Pharaoh included all the brothers that Joseph had missed, except one that wasn't part of the treachery, his younger brother, Benjamin. Do you have any other brothers, he said to them. And they said, oh, yes, we have this young brother, Benjamin. How goes it with Benjamin, Jacob inquires. Oh, he's doing fine. And then he said to them, if you want provisions from me, you're going to have to go back where you came from and tell your father that I want to see living proof that your brother is still alive, bring him here. That's the deal. That's the trade. You go back and get Benjamin and bring him to me. And they agree to do this. But he said, I'm going to hold one of you captive to make sure that you return. And so, the brother, Simeon, is retained in the court of Pharaoh as a hostage to the deal. And so the brothers return to their father. The hidden cup is revealed, the trick that Joseph played on them to make them look like they had stolen from the court. And from everybody's perspective, they were in a situation that was desperate. And they came to Jacob, and they told Jacob what had transpired. And Jacob is realizing, this is the second time you boys have come back to my house without one of my sons. Where is your brother? And they said, well, he's back in Egypt. They, they're holding him hostage. And for the moment, Jacob's world totally collapses, 
And Jacob, their father, said to them, You have bereaved me. What does that mean? Sons, you have broken my heart. You have brought me again into the house of mourning. You have pierced my own soul. Now listen to how Jacob makes an assessment of this real life situation. You have bereaved me. Joseph is no more. Simeon is no more. And you want to take Benjamin. Everything is against me. Look at it again. Joseph is gone. He's dead. He is no more. Simeon is gone. He is no more. And now everything is against me. You remember when you were children? Something bad had happened. You get left out of the party. You get ditched by your friends. And your heart would break in your juvenile disappointment. You thought the world was coming to an end. And you would sing the little ditty. Nobody loves me. Everybody hates me. I'm going to go eat worms. <laughs> that, that's our childish reaction to minor upheavals in our lives. Nobody loves me. Everybody hates me. I'm going to go eat worms. But in a profound sense, in an adult sense, that's what Jacob is saying. Joseph is no more. Simeon is no more. Everything is against me. Now, we could look at Jacob as just being an ancient example of the sad sack who walks around with this gloomy cloud over his head all the time. An inveterate pessimist whose glass is always half empty rather than half full. Everything is against me. An overreaction. Hyperbole. No. Because... Anything that Jacob could see from every human vantage point that he had at his disposal, his assessment of the life situation he was enduring was absolutely accurate. He had no reason whatsoever to believe that Joseph was anything but no more. He had precious little to hope for the survival of Simeon. And now his brothers seem to be caught in the treachery of stealing from the court of Pharaoh. He sent his sons down there to get food stuff, to get help from Pharaoh. Now his sons come back guilty of theft. And there goes his hope for any future provisions from the benevolent hand of Pharaoh. Everything is against me. One of the tricks of the trade in literature or in the filming of a movie is to create an intensification of drama through various forms of suspense and tension. One kind of drama is the surprise that you're not prepared for. When I was a little boy, we went to the movies to see the scariest movie that had ever been filmed. Up to that point, it was called The Thing. And all the way through the movie, you hear about this monster, The Thing. But you never see him. And then suddenly, without warning, on one occasion, a soldier in his Arctic outpost goes to the greenhouse door, and he opens the door. And then for the briefest of sections, you see, or at least you think you see, the monster standing at the door. You're not prepared for it. I'll never forget what happened. I watched that in the Whitehall Theater in Pittsburgh when I was a little boy. My best friend Johnny was sitting right next to me. And when the door of the greenhouse opened and the thing was there, literally, literally, physically, Johnny jumped into my lap. And there was a mad exit, a riot, panic, stampede of kids running out of the theater, terrified. But there's a worse kind of terror in drama. And that's when 
the audience knows that the enemy is at the door, but the hero of the story doesn't know it. Oh, I saw one movie where this murderer crept into the house and the audience knows it, but the woman doesn't. She's in the bedroom with her husband and she hears the noise from somebody creeping downstairs. And he says, I'll go down. She says, no, I want to look. And so she leaves and she creeps down and you're scared to death. Now the film changes and they show the man sneaking into the bedroom, knocking out the husband, putting him in the closet, turning the lights on and crawling into the bed. While the wife is downstairs looking to see the cause of this intruding noise. She can't find anything, so she's now comfortable and calm. She walks back up the stairs, and she heads for the bedroom. She walks in the door, and she's about to get in the bed. And what do you think the audience does? They're screaming out loud to the screen, don't get in that bed. See, that's the worst kind of tension. When you know what they don't know. Jacob thought he knew. But he didn't know. There wasn't a monster at the door. There wasn't a killer in his bed. What he didn't know was this Joseph, whom Jacob was sure had perished, had in fact been preserved by the providence of God. Joseph was still more. Joseph never had it so good in his whole life. At this very moment, when his father was convinced he had perished, Joseph was the prime minister of Egypt. At the very moment that he is convinced his other son, Simeon, has had it, Simeon is in the protective custody of a brother who loved him. And when Jacob was utterly convinced that everything was against him, the hand of God at that very second was working for his and for his whole nation's redemption. The reality of the situation was everything was for him. One of the fundamental creeds we say as Christians is Deus pro nobis. God for us. And for Jacob, when it most clearly seemed that God was against him. Because, beloved, if everything is against him, everything must include God. And he was convinced that God was against him too, when at that very moment, it was Deus pro Jacobus, God for Jacob. Going ahead of Jacob, providing a place for him, for his family, and for their seed. Well, the rest of the story unfolds when the brothers return. And finally come back to Jacob and explain to Jacob that his sons, in fact, were well and that Joseph was still alive. They went up out of Egypt, the Bible says in chapter 45, verse 25, they came to the land of Canaan and they came to Jacob, their father, and they said to him, saying, Joseph is still alive and he's governor over all the land of Egypt. And the Bible says, and Jacob's heart stood still because he didn't believe them. He couldn't believe them. He couldn't afford to believe. They were asking him to hope in the hopeless, to believe in the incredible. But when they told him all the words that Joseph had said to them, and when he saw the carts which Joseph had said to carry him, The spirit of Jacob, their father, revived. And Jacob said, it is enough. My son Joseph 
is still alive, I will go and see him before I die. For Jacob learned what it takes us a lifetime to learn, that the providence of God is always enough. In our Quorum Deo thought for today, we are reminded of this lesson that Jacob forgot the providence of God. He came to the conclusion that everything was against him. But aren't we like that? Aren't you like that? Haven't you, and many times in your life, believed that nothing was working for your benefit, that everything was against you? I've certainly come to those moments in my life. And when those moments come, then we need to hear, we need to read in bold letters this account in the life of Jacob. We see Jacob reading the circumstances around his own life completely wrong. If you are a Christian, then you know that God is for you, not against you. And that nothing can possibly separate us from the love of God that we have in Christ. That was the heroic message of the saints of the New Testament who were convinced that in the midst of their suffering, in the midst of persecutions, in the midst of the hatred that they were receiving from a world that was hostile to them, that in that they saw the love of God sustaining them. And we need to see it too if we are to stand in the day of trouble. For more information about Ligonier Ministries, call 1-800-435-4343 or contact us on the web at Ligonier.org. That's L-I-G-O-N-I-E-R dot O-R-G. Or write P.O. Box 54-7500, Orlando, Florida, 32854.